Hey guys, so today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the classical period. So this is uh, unit seven, <clears throat> and we're going to be um, talking about a lot of stuff from the year 1750 to 1820. Now this um, PowerPoint, the slideshow, it's pretty long. I'm going to try to go through this as quickly as I can. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to try to not leave anything out. So we'll <laughs> we'll see how that goes. All right, so I'm going to share screen. And let's see. <clears throat> let's get this thing started. <clears throat> All right, so like I said, classical period. Uh, approximately 1750 ends at about 1820. Um, you know, those those dates are kind of relative, although, uh, you know, we talked about with the Baroque period how um, J.S. Bach, he died in 1750. So that kind of signifies the end of the Baroque and um, also signifies that there's something new about to begin, which is the classical period. So <clears throat> here are learning objectives. Um, you guys can kind of look over that. I give you a bunch of the key individuals that are discussed here in the PowerPoint, in the chapter, um, and also the terms. All the terms come from the chapter of the book, and you know the the definitions are all in the glossary. Um, important events. Uh, this kind of lists when you know, the different composers are born, when they die, just so you can have a you know, kind of a, <clears throat> a neat timeline, a neat rundown of when things happen. Um, uh, one thing to kind of point out is the Declaration of Independence. You know, we, we declare our independence from Great Britain in 1776 during this period of history. And, you know, you've got the American Revolution, you've got the French Revolution happening after that. So there's a lot of stuff going on and a, and a lot of stuff in our own American history that happens during the classical period. But we really won't talk about that. It's just good to know that, you know, this is going on over here in America while, uh, you know, all this other stuff is going on <clears throat> in Europe. So moving on. Um, so just some context for you guys. So um, one reason why, well, two reasons why they call this the classical period. Um, number one, the, the big three composers from this era are Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven. And their music um, has pretty much been the standard. It served as the model for composers that have come after them. Um, so that's one reason why it's called the classical period because it's it's classic music kind of like how you know we designate like classic rock um cla you know other things classic um the second thing and this is kind of the big reason why they call it the classical period is the greek and roman influences um you know this this has happened before you know go back to the renaissance where it's um, where the Renaissance was, uh, you know, influenced by, you know, Greek ideals. Well, this is the same thing, but a little bit different. Um, in art and in um, music, it's more about, um, well, especially music, it's more about like balance, um, symmetry, like everything is, is kind of neat and very structured. Uh, whereas in the Baroque, everything was, well, not everything, but a lot of stuff was considered, you know, excessive, gaudy, you know, kind of overdone, things like that. So the classical period is a reaction to that. So everything, and we'll talk about this when we get to the form section, like everything is very, very structured. Um, and that's, I mean, it's kind of the same in art, but you know, we'll we'll talk about that in just a in just a moment. Um, other things that are going on, 
So this time period is also called like the age of reason or the enlightenment. Um, lots of really, really big changes going on. So you've got um, changes in politics, governance. So, you know, people are starting to question the monarchies, question all of these noble, rich people. You know, the wealth distribution has changed. So the middle class is not only growing, like more people are in the middle class, but also the middle class has more money. They are consuming more and therefore they have more power in the direction of history of their you know, respective areas and countries. So that's starting to change. And I miss and mentioned the aristocracy, you know, that that changes as well, especially with all of the revolutions going on. Um, <clears throat> lots of different publications and scientific discoveries. You know, this dates all the way back to talking about Isaac Newton and John Locke. In the Baroque period, this just kind of continues. Uh, with Rousseau, he was a philosopher that um, kind of fueled, help, well, helped to fuel a lot of the political change and the revolutions. Um, Voltaire kind of did the same thing. He wrote Candide, which was a very famous book. Um, Leonard Bernstein, who was a composer, but also the music director of uh, the New York Philharmonic for many years, he actually wrote um, an opera musical about candide um and it's it's a comic it's a comic satire it and it pretty much criticizes criticized everything <laughs> people like no one was safe <laughs> even other philosophers like it just criticized a lot of things that were going on in the world at the time um napoleon <clears throat> you can't not mention napoleon um Napoleon Bonaparte, a uh, French political leader, a military leader. He um, led the revolution, the French Revolution, and installed himself as emperor um, until he was exiled. Then he came back, and then he was killed at the Battle of Waterloo. Uh, I can't remember exactly what year that was, but you know, if you're if you're interested, you can look him up. Um, but it's really good to know that he was alive during this time. And um, he did influence a lot of the things going on in art and in music, um, especially art, but uh, like Beethoven, we'll talk about Beethoven. He actually dedicated a couple of his pieces of music to Napoleon um, when, you know, before Napoleon installed himself as emperor. We'll talk about that maybe if we have time. Um, but anyway, all of this stuff, the Enlightenment, it led to all, a lot of the political revolutions in Europe. So scientific achievements, we've got electricity, Benjamin Franklin, uh, lots of different medical vaccinations and other medical discoveries, uh, discovering oxygen as a molecule, uh, beginning the study of astronomy, of space, got steam engines, cotton gin, battery, all this crazy stuff going on which in the end leads towards the industrial revolution which we'll talk about in the next period all right so <clears throat> the industrial revolution it begins during this era um <clears throat> so this begins kind of the the whole idea of capitalism you've got lots of factories um, owned by the middle class Therefore, you know, there's a lot of money that's being funneled more into the middle class and the middle class strengthens. Therefore, they are consuming more art and more music. And that's going to change a lot of stuff like that changes who the artists, who the composers are writing music for. It's not just the rich nobles. It's for common everyday people. It's for everybody now. So, and I mean, you kind of, I don't know if you can really see it here, but definitely in the next period, the romantic period, um, there, there's a definite shift, like a big shift as to like composers starting to write music about different kinds of things. And we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to it. Um, let's see, literacy. So like I said, music is written specifically for the middle class, not just to listen to, but to also play just for you know leisurely playing 
um people are reading like newspapers periodicals novels literature like all of this stuff so education like that's changing it's not just the rich like the middle class is be is becoming educated as well which leads towards the revolution um patronage in terms of music so before you know we talked about limited to the church and wealthy nobles now composers are um kind of going out more on their own uh like haydn when we talk about him like he was still uh he still had a wealthy family uh, as his patron so that's you know more of the old style beethoven uh, mozart mozart had um patrons beethoven had patrons but it wasn't like one distinct patron that he worked for lived there he was you know they weren't servants to their patron like haydn was he was still technically a servant he was a paid servant um so mozart and beethoven they had a lot of freedom to write kind of what they wanted um to organize concerts you know do their own publicity um it was a lot of work but it was i mean there was a lot more freedom involved you know you're not just writing for your employer you can do kind of whatever you want to do which is great and leads towards a lot of the stuff um, written in the romantic period and now you know this is a precursor to what we have now in in art music um let's see with the visual arts so they don't really call it the classical period but it's called the neoclassical style um but same kind of thing it's influenced by greek and roman um history um there's stuff portraying you know uh like the oath like this picture right here of jacques louis david um like these older stories of greek and roman stories um paintings like that and then there are other ones on the next slide you're going to see a uh, more of a contemporary depiction of the art from the the classical period but um everything's it's analytical it's very symmetrical it's clean so not excessive it's just very clean and precise but also um there's not a lot of individuality with the classical period um and once we get to the romantic you're gonna i mean it's another one of those things where the romantic period is a reaction to the classical classical period it's all neat symmetrical clean there's no individuality not a lot of expression the romantic period is a reaction to that there's so much expression so much individuality like hyper individualized styles um so <clears throat> You know, th this is just, again, like everything, every period in history is just a reaction from the other. The Baroque was considered to be very excessive, like kind of too gaudy, like too much about nature and humanism. So the classical period kind of scales that back and, and kind of refocuses everything. Um, now, a lot of... So if I can get to the next one. Here we go. A lot of the art, um, since there were many revolutions and lots of political changes going on, a lot of the art was infused with those kinds of ideals. Um, David was one of those painters. Um, so he was a painter of the neoclassical style. He was French. So he was very involved in the French Revolution and all that stuff. But um, like I mentioned, um, you know, the Baroque style with art, with painting, you go from the Rococo, which was very lighthearted, lots of nature scenes and all that sort of stuff to like really more serious um, types of paintings and paintings that are very politically charged. Um, they do have a lot of feelings, like heightened feelings, like um, the painting here it's the death of marat and this like this painting it has a lot of feelings in it um marat he was a french official who was assassinated he was a friend of david um of course david felt very 
um, very strongly about this and wanted to do something um, about this, you know, for his friend. So, you know, this painting, it served as a way for David to turn him into a political martyr for the revolution and pretty much um, like kind of sparked, uh, you, you know, just pushed the, rev pushed the French revolution into happening more and more. Um, but yeah, you have a lot more of these, these types of paintings. Now, even though this one like it's politically like it's a political painting um you have like themes where it's you've got morality uh, it's very intellectual because if you dissect it and look closely um you can actually read like names on the paper that marat is holding in the in the painting and that was intentional by David. He put names down there of people that were probably involved with the killing. Um, but you notice that it's still, like, it's still very balanced. Um, it's still very clean. It's not really excessive. You get the scene. Um, there's not really excessive amounts of blood or anything. It's not extremely graphic but it's you know it's clean it's balanced and it serves a purpose you know that's the main thing it serves a very distinct purpose um and that that kind of um you know characterizes a lot of the art from this period so anyway moving on to the music stuff um so in the baroque you know i mentioned that um things become more homophonic because of the orchestras. You've got chords, there's more emphasis on harmony. So you have definite chords with melodies and, and such being played on top. Uh, that continues. So the music of, of the classical period is mostly homophonic, uh, meaning that it is very harmonically driven, like by scales and chords and stuff. Um, you've got new genres like the symphony, the quartet, and not not the orchestra, but you know sometimes it's called the symphony orchestra, but the symphony as the the actual piece of music that's being written. Um, you've got more dynamics, uh, so use of crescendos and decrescendos. The melodic lines they change, so they're shorter. Um, they're going to be more balanced, uh, shorter phrases, symmetrical lines. But the main thing about the melodies are that they are very memorable. So shorter and easier to remember and think of them as being like tuneful. Okay. Um, like I mentioned, new emphasis on form, so structure. And like I said, greater use of dynamics, articulations, um, the way that people play the music, uh, tempos. So that's, you know, fast, slow, all that in between. So um, <clears throat> the balance and the symmetry part. So basically, if, um, if a composer writes a melody and it's four bars, four measures, they are then going to write like another melody that answers that, that is also four bars. So you've got eight symmetrical bars of two symmetrical melodies. <laughs> one that's kind of a statement, one that's kind of an answer. So, and, and all the composers kind of think this way. So it's very structured. That's where the form kind of comes in. Um, they use form in order to like highly structure all of the music. Um, they are adding some more expression, especially with the dynamics, like that's there. Um, but we really get into the use of ex like lots of expression in the romantic period, but it kind of begins here. Um, and also you just have a, like a slower more of a distinct harmonic progression, like progression from like chord to chord. Um, so you can tell like what harmony they're using at any given time. 
And that also kind of falls in line with the form. Like they're just very, um, they're very distinct with um, the melodies, the rhythms, the harmonies. It's all based on the form and the structure of the music. So the form kind of dictates a lot of it. Now, performing forces, things that are different, the piano forte or just the piano, that becomes the main keyboard instrument from now on. You've got string quartets. Uh, this is two violins, a viola, and a cello. This becomes a very important um, chamber ensemble. All composers write music for string quartet. And they're also writing music for more chamber ensembles. That's where the chamber music comes from. That's where that term comes from. Um, the orchestra gets bigger, so about 30 to 60 musicians, so it doubles in size. You've got the four distinct sections that we've talked about, strings, woodwinds, brass, percussion. So you're adding flutes and oboes, trumpets, trombones later on, and then lots more percussion like cymbals, triangle, the big timpani drums, lots of different things. So with these new instruments and more instruments, you can, um, composers could create different colors, different timbres, different sounds. Um, there's no more basso continuo, uh, so no more harpsichord and all that stuff. It's just, um, it's all, it's just the orchestra. So therefore, since there's no basso continuo, they have to have a conductor to lead everything. So this is the introduction of the true like orchestra conductor. And they also have um, concert masters. So this is usually the principal or first um, violin player. Um, they can serve as the conductor if the conductor is out, but they're also just kind of the leader of the string, all the strings, leader of the string section. Um, so yeah, a couple of, you know, those are um, the main things to keep in mind. And next is musical form. So we have a lot of different, uh, a lot of new different forms. Um, the first one is theme and variations. And it's just like it says, um, you have a theme and that theme uh, can be taken and varied a number of times. You can have one variation, two, you can have eight, nine, ten, however many variations you really want to have. Um, <clears throat> but as you can see in the example that I give, you know, each variation, like it's going to be designated as A um, because it's just a variation on the same material. Um, you've got minuet and trio. These are I guess you could say old forms, they're dance forms from the Baroque period, but they're being used in different ways. Um, <clears throat> composers would include these in uh, as you know, movements of a symphony or a movement of a string quartet or, you know, anything out there. Um, but usually a minuet and trio, it's going to be an A, B, A form. The minuet is A, the trio is B. And then it always does a da capo, which down there it says to the head. Basically, that means you play through the music. So you play through the minuet, you play through the trio. And then at the end of the trio, you repeat back and play through the minuet. So A, B, A. So you're repeating the A section or the head. That, you know, that's a lot of times they would call the head the beginning of the piece. Um, so there's that. <clears throat> Scherzo is pretty much a fast dance form. It's a fast version of ABA form. Um, this is a lot of composers, especially Beethoven, started to write and include more scherzos like in their symphonies. Um, instead of doing a third movement as a minuet and trio, he might do uh, a scherzo. Um, as an example, um, his symphony number three, he actually wrote a minuet and trio for the third movement. But later on, like in symphony number seven, it's a scherzo for the third movement. So the composers evolved. They began to see the minuet and trio as being outdated. Um, <clears throat> so they wanted to create something new. That's where the scherzo came from. 
um, Rondo. It was a popular instrumental form. Um, <clears throat> Rondo would have been, it could have been like third movement to uh, a sonata or a concerto for an instrument. Uh, for instance, um, Mozart, he always wrote a rondo as his third movement to most concertos that he wrote. Um, rondos are fast. They're, they're in triple meter instead of duple. Um, so they kind of have, have like a dancing kind of feel to it. Um, the form for that can be varied. You can have a five part or a seven part rondo. So abaca, A-B-A-C-A -A is the five part. Uh, abacada, A-B-A-C-A-D-A -A -A is the seven part. So um, the theme here is that like you're always going to come back to the beginning material, or at least that's kind of the theme from the classical period. They're always going to repeat uh, what they started out with, the original stuff. Um, so yeah. <clears throat> Those are the main forms, the main new ones to kind of know about. Um, the big one, though, and this is the the form that everybody used for almost anything, um, is sonata form. So this was the most important innovation in form during the classical period. Um, commonly, uh, sonata form, like any first movement of anything, symphony, string quartet, um, uh, so like a sonata obviously or um, <clears throat> a concerto that will usually be in sonata form um, so sonata form it's three different sections basically so the exposition it's all the main themes and you're going to hear them in the main harmonies the main keys so we would say tonic and dominic, dominant, dominic, tonic and dominant, one and five. <clears throat> um, that'll be in the exposition. In the development, it takes all these themes and um, kind of does variations of them, throws in different harmonies. It goes through a lot of different keys. It goes as far away from the home key as it can and then comes back uh, for the recap or the recapitulation. We'll just call it the recap. But this basically brings back all the primary themes <clears throat> in the home, in the tonic key. So you've got kind of this, I mean, you could really call it A, B, A kind of form, but it's a, it's a little bit different. This is a little more nuanced than the A, B, A kind of stuff. Um, the, the sonata form, um, it has a lot of different, it can have like two or three themes or even four or five different themes in the exposition. Um, the development can last as long as the composer wants it to, you know, it, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of different things can be done with sonata form. Um, uh, one of our vo uh, not well, vocab, but just important terms is coda. So sometimes um, composers will add a coda or like a tail section, um, just a short little tag to the end of uh, the movement. And it just reemphasizes the tonic, the home key, and provides like <clears throat> very dramatic conclusion. So it's going to be loud and it's going to be very much in whatever key uh, the piece started off in. So... <clears throat> um, in the PowerPoint on the next slide, you, uh, you can listen through, um, this is, uh, Mozart's horn concerto number two. Um, it's just the first movement, uh, which is in sonata form. And you can kind of hear the first, like, few minutes are the exposition. It, it introduces the different themes. And then, once you hear kind of a change in the sound where it goes to like a minor kind of sound, like a not necessarily dissonant, but, but kind of like a dark sound, that's where the development is. And then when you start to hear the themes that were presented at the beginning, that's the recap or the recapitulation. 
So you can go through that and listen and, and see if you can um, hear all the, all the different stuff in there. All right, on. So <clears throat> just a little bit more about the new genres. We talked about forms. Now we got the genres. Um, I mentioned sonata. It's not just a form, but it's also a genre um, written for instrument and piano. Uh, it's usually in three movements and uh, usually has sonata form. And you've got concertos. We talked about that um, solo instrument with orchestra. Symphony. Um, so an orchestral composition for public concert. Um, yes, there were symphonies written before, but the symphony kind of becomes the main, um, the main type of composition being composed and being performed at concerts. Um, and really it, it becomes the measure of how good a composer is. Like if they wrote really good symphonies or operas, then they were usually seen as a very good composer. So four movements, um, it's usually gonna be a fast followed by a slow and typically some kind of dance style. So that's where a minuet and trio or the scherzo comes in. And then the end is a fast conclusion. Uh, mentioned the string quartet. Um, it can have three or four movements to it, but remember string quartet, two violins, a viola and a cello, no double bass. Um, lots of different types of chamber music. A string quartet is a chamber piece. It's a type of chamber music, but you've got other things like art songs. So um, songs for a voice and piano, um, piano pieces like for piano alone. Um, like I mentioned, you've got instrumental sonatas for instrument and piano. Um, you've got lots of different things going on. And more of this is being written because of the growth of the middle class. You know, these people are learning how to play instruments and they want to be able to, you know, perform stuff, uh, you know, not publicly, not for, you know, a job, but just, you know, for their own enjoyment. So now opera, we'll talk a little bit about this. So there are two different types of opera now. So you've got opera buffa or comic opera. So this is, I mean, it, it is what it says. It's a comedy. So it's supposed to be funny. Um, Mozart was really good at writing opera buffa, wrote lots of them. Well, um, you'll listen to an example of one of them, the magic flute. And then you also have opera seria or serious opera. So usually opera seria will feature like mythological stories or uh, a story about like highborn characters plots revolving around high society or, or some kind of historical fiction or something like that. So um, those are the two different kinds. We'll kind of focus on opera buffa because that is something that's kind of new. All right. So moving on, we come to our first composer, um, Joseph, Franz Joseph Haydn or Joseph Haydn. So he was Austrian, so born in Austria, not Australia, but Austria. So Austria is um, right there next to Germany. <clears throat> he was born in 1732, lived until 1809, so he was 77 when he passed. Uh, and I know, you know, his picture is down there, down there in the corner. Um, he does kind of favor George Washington, but he's not kind of Thomas Jefferson-ish, but no. That's Joseph Haydn. They all wore the same kinds of wigs. Um, that was just kind of the style back then. So uh, yeah, that's why they kind of all look alike. They all wore the same style of fancy wigs. Um, Haydn, he uh, played the harpsichord and violin. Um, his main thing, um, you know, I mentioned patronage. So Haydn was kind of, I mean, he was, he came before Mozart and Beethoven, so kind of old school. Um, he spent most of his life as a servant, basically. He worked for the Esterhazy family, a um, Bohemian Hungarian family um, that lived pretty close to, um, to Vienna in Austria. And um, 
he basically wrote music that was performed for his patrons. He ran the orchestra there at the estate, um, staged operas at the estate, all that sort of stuff. Now, um, thankfully, <clears throat> his the Esterhazy family, they actually allowed him to publish his music. So instead of just being for that family, he was, you know, he was able to publish it and therefore it was spread throughout Europe. So um, that happened in 1779. And pretty soon after that, you know, about five to 10 years after he was one of the most famous composers in Europe, because um, before then, all of his music had been kept kind of secret at the Esterhazy estate. But once he was able to publish it, you know, his fame kind of blew up. Um, 1791 to 1795, he spent in London, mainly because there were, um, there was a change in leadership in the Esterhazy family. They, um, they downsized a lot of stuff. So Haydn was free to leave for a little while. He wrote a lot of stuff in London. He wrote 10 symphonies often referred to as the London symphonies. And, um, I think they're, um, I want to say the listening assignment for this unit is um, is from one of the London symphonies. The uh, it's called the Surprise Symphony, so you guys will get to listen to that and and learn a little bit about it. Um, so when he came back from London, he returned to work for the Esterhazy family in 1796 and pretty much stayed there until his death in 1809. Um, he was called the father of the symphony and the father of the string quartet. He wrote over a hundred symphonies and he wrote lots and lots of string quartets. Um, he was kind of the first to write a lot for string quartet and kind of establish it as an ensemble. Um, and his writing for both genres are really, really great. Um, consider some of the best examples that we have. Um, his music in general is known for the melodies uh, he does use some like folk tunes, some Austrian bohemian folk tunes, and he is, um, he, he does, he's very witty, um, known for incorporating that wit into his music, and you'll kind of figure that out with the Surprise Symphony. Um, I'll let you guys read a little bit about that. It's, it's in the chapter of the, of the book, so. Um, so we're going to, well, you guys are going to listen to the second movement of his emperor quartet and this is a string quartet um it is a theme and variations and down here you've got um the timing for when the different uh variations happen so it starts out with the theme variation one is about minute 39 variation two two minutes 47 uh three is 410 and then variation four is about five minutes 30 seconds so you guys um and listen to this. Um, this is just the second movement from it. Um, and it's a very, it's a really great piece. This is one of his most famous um, string quartets, his most performed string quartets. Now you'll notice the title. So string quartet number 62, opus 76, number three. So <clears throat> they would usually number like how many pieces. So yeah, he wrote a lot of string quartets. Um, like symphony, the surprise symphony, I think is symphony number 94. Um, so yeah, you number like what number of symphony or string quartet it is. The opus is, it, the opus number is to kind of like categorize things. So this is like one of a number of string quartets in this particular opus number. So opus 76 is like a set of these different string quartets that he wrote probably at a probably around the same time so you kind of group them together but anyway the numbers that's a way to categorize all the um all the different pieces and to kind of help composers and musicologists keep track of everything so anyway probably more than you wanted to know about that but oop sorry i hit it wrong i apologize i hit the wrong button there Okay, going back, so we got Mozart. So Mozart, um, his full name 
as Johannes, Chrysostomus, Wolfgangus, Theophilus, Mozart. Um, that is his bat, you know, his Christian baptized name. Um, normally, his shortened name is Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, uh, but normally we just call him Mozart because he is the Mozart. Um, now, his father, Leopold, was actually a composer and a musician. Um, his sister was a musician, uh, played piano, kind of composed a little bit, but uh, Wolfgang, like he, he was the most famous out of all of them. Um, so he was Austrian, uh, born in 1756, died in 1791. So he was 35, very, very young. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, one of a few composers, uh, really famous, really great composers that died extremely young. The other one, who I think was also 35 or even younger when he died was, uh, Schubert. Um, but anyway, uh, Mozart was an amazing piano keyboard player, really good violin player. I mean, he could pretty much do whatever you wanted him to. Um, he was a true prodigy. He started composing music at age five. Um, between then and age 17, his father would, Leopold would parade um, <clears throat> Wolfgang and his sister like all throughout Europe, um, giving concerts and performing for nobles, for emperors and kings and queens and all that sort of stuff. So he um, did not really have a, a very normal childhood. Uh, you could probably compare him to, say, Michael Jackson, um, who probably at about the same age was, you know, thrust into, into the spotlight. So uh, Mozart didn't really have a chance to grow up. Um, it, you know, he had a very interesting personality. Um, he had an interesting sense of humor. And he, he was kind of a jokester. Um, he would be a person that you would kind of call immature nowadays. But it probably, a lot of it stems from lack of a childhood, his father. I mean, being abusive and just, you know, making him practice and perform at all hours of the night and the day and whenever. You know, they, he, Mozart lived and breathed music from the time he could remember anything or know anything. So that's all he knew. So by the age of 17, um, he was already like a full-time court musician in Salzburg where he was born. Um, <clears throat> not soon after that, he, um, or not too long after that, he moved to Vienna of 1781. Um, he married, uh, rose to fame with a lot of his operas and symphonies, especially the operas. Everybody loved the operas. Um, his most famous one was The Marriage of Figaro that kind of established him in Vienna. Um, and he was actually <clears throat> employed by the emperor. Um, and but really, it wasn't like a full-time thing. He was employed by the emperor just so that they could keep him in Vienna. Um, it was a very, very modest, like very modest part-time job. Um, he was basically composing like dance tunes for balls and different things, like something that was very, very beneath his status as a composer, but it was all they could do. It was all the emperor could give him um, in order to keep him in Vienna. Um, Aside from that, I mean, Mozart put on lots of concerts on his own, um, organized them, all the productions. Uh, he had other patrons that, um, you know, kept him afloat. But by 1791, um, he fell ill. A lot of people think it was because he just worked himself to death. Um, we're not really sure, not really certain how he died. Um, but in his short 35 years, he composed over 800 works, um, which is amazing. Um, you know, Mozart, he, 
pretty much had everything figured out in his head before he wrote it down. If you ever see a manuscript that was written by Mozart, it is pristine. It is like somebody copied it and, and didn't make a wrong move anywhere. Like that's how good he was as a composer. Um, <clears throat> in comparison, Beethoven, like his stuff looks like chicken scratch. Um, but that's just, that was the way he worked. Um, Beethoven would actually like literally compose on anything that was near him. He would compose on the walls of his apartment, on the piano, on whatever was at his disposal. <clears throat> um, Mozart, not so much. He was very meticulous um, with what he did. Now, at his death, um, Mozart was pretty much poor. Um, he owed a lot of money. So he was given like a pauper's death, like a common burial, um, not the pomp and circumstance that was warranted for someone of his stature and of his greatness, really. Um, there were services held after he passed away, but his original funeral was uh, pretty uh, plain. It was a, a common burial. Now, the financial instability comes from his immaturity, his inability to save money. Uh, he just spent money lavishly on many different things, food, clothes. He gambled much of it away. Um, it's pretty sad because if you think about it, I mean, he could have lived another 40 some odd years and who knows how much music, like who knows what he would have come up with if he had lived. That's kind of the sad thing. Um, because he, he was so innovative and such a great composer. Uh, and he was just like really starting out. He was just about to reach the midpoint of his life, of his career. So we'll never know. Um, I would, you know, encourage you guys to watch um, the movie Amadeus. Uh, it was Oscar winning movie came out in 1982, I think really great movie i mean some of it's fact a lot of it, like the storyline is fiction i mean yes the people are are real but the story is is fictionalized um it's 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 for you know dramatic effect but it's a really good movie um i would encourage you guys to watch it um because it, it it's worth it, it's worth watching at least once so um, mention the opera, like he's very well known for his opera. I already talked about Marriage of Figaro. Um, that's where the, the picture up there comes from. Um, also wrote other ones, Don Giovanni, um, The Abduction from the Seraglio. Seraglio is uh, a Turkish harem, um, whorehouse for lack of a better term. Um, yeah. Um, Anyway, it, that one's actually pretty good. It's not, it's not what you think it is. Um, some, basically, somebody's beloved was kidnapped and they're trying to rescue her. That's basically what it, what it is. It, it does have some very stereotypical borderline racist themes in it. So, you know, there's that. Um, but it, it's a good opera. Um, Cosi Fantuti, which is another comic one. Um, it's about women and love. Uh, but the magic flute is kind of his magnum opus in terms of opera. Um, it was the first uh, major opera to be composed in German, which is pretty cool. Uh, most operas were either composed in uh, Italian or there were some in French or English. So finally, they get one in German. And I'm not going to read through all the synopsis, but you guys can can read through it um it it's very mythological um <clears throat> it's a it's a pretty cool opera i mean obviously with the name magic flute you know <laughs> there's got to be some magic and mythology involved um but you guys are going to listen to the queen of the night aria which is pretty much the most famous i mean there are a lot of famous tunes from this opera but this is probably the most famous one 
Um, and these pictures are from scenes uh, from the magic flute. But basically in the Queen of the Night aria, um, the Queen of the Night herself uh, wants her daughter Pamina to assassinate uh, the Queen of the Night's rival, Sarastro. Um, and basically it's the Queen of the Night telling Pamina that if she doesn't do this, um, she doesn't have a home, doesn't have a family anymore. So yeah, um, I give you the translation there because it is, like I said, in German. So there's a translation and you guys can enjoy the Queen of the Night aria. Um, yeah. And, the, and, and this is a pretty cool staging of it. Um, some, some productions go all out and this one does. Um, the costumes are pretty interesting as well. So yeah, you guys enjoy that. I've heard it a million times. I don't need to hear it again. Um, so on to a composer that's not in the book. So Mariana Martine, um, she was Austrian. Huh a theme here like you know before we talked about german composers um english french composers in the classical period like most of the great composers come from austria or beethoven's from germany but at the time germany is part of the austrian empire so you know technically he's austrian he also lived a long time in vienna so yeah um but anyway martinet she was a woman, a female composer, born in 1744, um, died in 1812. So she lived to be 68. Um, so, I mean, she was forgotten, like was not included in musical history books and all that sort of stuff. Um, but she was uh, one of Vienna's like most prominent composers of her time. So she came from a military family. Father was a military officer. So she, she wasn't like wealthy, wealthy, but she didn't really have to worry about anything. Um, Haydn actually taught her music lessons. And then um, in return, she introduced him to some really important people and kind of helped his career. So basically, I think the story was Haydn actually lived in like an apartment building owned by uh, Martinez family so he would give her music lessons and in return you know she would just introduce them to different people you know um, so Martinez she was not only a really good composer she was also a great singer and harpsichord player um, and she also trained and taught um, many of the top female like operatic vocalists in Vienna because opera huge at this point in time um now martinet like she didn't hold like a formal position didn't really have um patronage or anything like that um <clears throat> i, I want to say that she was given a very generous um inheritance and that's how she was able to um work as a composer and and do the things that she wanted to do but yeah, she did not hold a formal position. Um, even, even so, she composed over 200 works. Um, and her earliest one dates back to when she was about 16. A couple of uh, really important things to remember. So she's the first woman to compose a symphony. And remember, the symphony was the measure of how good you were as a composer. That and opera. Okay, they were, that was the measuring stick. Um, and she was also like, she received lots and lots of awards as well in Vienna um, and different kinds of titles that were, um, <clears throat> you know, something like um, winner of the Grand Prix of Composition of Austria, you know, making up something, but something like that. Um, you know, the fact that she was forgotten not included in a lot of musical textbooks the fact that i didn't learn anything about her in music school shows the misogyny and the bias um, within classical music within art music um, because just within the past couple of decades um, this is when we've been learning about people like martinet um, 
Jacquet, who we talked about in the Baroque period. Um, another guy that we're going to talk about coming up soon. You know, a lot of these people, they were swept under the rug because they weren't the norm. They weren't the norm. They weren't a man. You know, it wasn't a woman. What I mean, sorry. They weren't male and they weren't, or they weren't like white European, basically. So thankfully, you know, we're finally learning more about these kind of forgotten composers because her music is really great so um like i mentioned she was a really good piano a harpsichordist piano player um so she wrote a lot of music for piano and harpsichord so you guys will listen to um part of her piano concerto it's kind of a mixture between haydn and mozart um with a little bit you know with something a little bit different thrown in but it's really good i think you guys will will enjoy it all right now next is another person that was forgotten by history um joseph balone so balone he was um french creole so <clears throat> he was born in guadalupe and he was the son of a wealthy plantation owner, uh, Georges de Boulogne Saint Georges, and his mother was an enslaved African woman, a slave owned by Saint Georges. So <clears throat> that is the main reason why he was forgotten. Um, thankfully, he um, Joseph was. Um, taken care of by his father he was actually sent to paris um, he didn't stay in guadalupe he was sent to paris to be educated so he was not only you know educated like normal people but he was also educated as a gendarme to the king um, which is basically kind of like a man at arms um, he was essentially trained as a knight um, cavalier whatever you want to call it um so he was skilled at fencing a really awesome swordsman um and he did become a knight to the king of france and his official title was the chevalier de saint georges so he was not only a composer but he was an actual black knight which is really really cool um the Chevalier, um, he actually fought in the French Revolution, um, did a lot of this stuff, um, led his own battalion in the revolution. And aside from that, I, it, this probably plays into his fencing skills, but he was an amazing violin player, virtuoso level violin player. Um, and I want to say, well, Never mind. I, I think that's somebody else. But anyway, great violinist. He was also a conductor. Um, he actually led one of the um, premier amateur groups in Paris. Um, was very well respected as a conductor. Um, so his nickname, and this is, again, it shows you the misogyny, the bias. Um, his nickname was the Black Mozart. Um that and i'm just guessing this was not meant to be a compliment even though people probably thought it was a compliment um the fact that he was of african descent didn't mean anything he was just as good of a composer as anybody else in vienna um and a very very good violin player and conductor as well. Um, he was actually in line to be uh, the conductor for the Paris Opera, but people found out about it and they didn't want the Chevalier, a person of African descent, being in such a position. So um, yeah, people uh, on the board of the Paris Opera, they vetoed it and it went to somebody else which is really, really sad because I'm sure he would have done an amazing job. Um, so he is um, pretty, pretty much the first known classical composer 
of African ancestry. Um, like I said, the first one that we that we know of. Um, first, probably one of the first people that we know of of African descent to become a chevalier, uh, a knight to the king of France, which was also really, really cool. Um, but he wrote lots of pieces of music, um, operas, string quartets, lots of music for violin, which is his instrument, and he wrote some symphonies. Um, however, there are a lot of dubious works, um, works that people tried to say uh, were written by Joseph alone, but were not, actually. Um, so you guys will get to listen to a sonata for two violins that he composed. Now, in the title, it says um, Sonata for Two Violins in B-flat major, opus posthumous. So the P-O-S-T-H, that means posthumous. So basically, this was found after his death um, and added to his catalog of, of works after his death. But um, <clears throat> a really, really great piece of music. And I mean... If anything else, you got to give it to him, like for being like the Chevalier de Saint George is just an awesome name, like amazing. <laughs> um, so our last composer, we finally got there. It's a lot of stuff in this one, I know, is Ludwig van Beethoven. Everybody knows Beethoven. Um, you guys, those of you that have played piano, have probably done Fury Elise or any other piece by Beethoven, Moonlight Sonata, all that sort of stuff. Um, Beethoven was German, so 1770 to 1827. He was 56 when he uh, passed away. Um, he was an amazing, uh, we say pianist, um, piano player, somebody that performs on the piano. Um, but a, an amazing pianist, um, and he was kind of like Mozart, like a prodigy taught from a very young age to play, um, performing at a very young age, composing at a very young age. Um, uh, sad, a couple of sad things. Um, Beethoven's father was an alcoholic, was very abusive. So kind of along the lines with Mozart, like Beethoven had very rough childhood Um his mother passed away um, during his, I can't remember how old he was, but sometime during Beethoven's teen years. Um, but thankfully, <clears throat> there was a wealthy count in Bonn, B-O-N-N, -N, Germany, where Beethoven was born and lived at the beginning of his life, Count Ferdinand, Ferdinand Waldstein. Um, Beethoven actually wrote a piano sonata for uh, this count called the Waldstein uh, Sonata. Um, but Waldstein was an early patron of Beethoven's and actually sent Beethoven to Vienna to, to study. Um, there he played for Mozart, um, studied with Haydn a little bit, um, <clears throat> and then came back and then moved back to Vienna for, for good afterwards. Um, Beethoven, it, it, is famous for the fact that he became deaf, like he lost his hearing uh, completely. Uh, he began to lose his hearing sometime during the late 1790s and was completely deaf by 1818. So pretty much the last nine, 10 years of his life, he spent not being able to hear anything, any of his music. So the fact that he was going deaf caused a lot of turmoil, it caused a lot of depression, um, and this all came, you know, it, there was this one defining moment known as the Heligenstadt Testament of 1802. And in this testament, um, he pretty much uh, kind of uh, reaffirms his commitment to life because um, he had considered, you know, committing suicide. I mean, you're a musician, you're losing your hearing. It's pretty traumatic um but with this he reaffirmed re yeah reaffirmed his commitment to music in general and basically said you know 
music is worth living for. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to dedicate my life to composing music. And, and that's what he did. Even when he completely lost his hearing, he still wrote music. Um, because of all this stuff, he had a very interesting personality. Um, he was a little aloof, even though he wanted to be around people. He wanted to have friends, but he was very difficult to get along with um, and very particular about lots of things. Like he, he loved drinking coffee and he had to have like the right number of beans ground for his coffee every single day or it just or it wasn't right um crazy very yeah very interesting person um so beethoven he didn't hold like any position he was fully funded by patrons um so he was you know him him and mozart were kind of the first um solo artist i guess so to speak um they um composed their own works put on their own concerts raise their own money and all that stuff. Um, and he almost wrote as many works as Mozart. He wrote 722. And Beethoven, I mean, Haydn wrote over 100 symphonies. Mozart wrote 40 some odd symphonies. Uh, Beethoven wrote nine, but they are like the gold standard of symphonies. Um, and everyone after beethoven like if they wrote a symphony it has been compared to beethoven's symphonies like he is kind of the the symphonic master so to speak um and this uh thing of writing nine symphonies um it, it you know it actually became a thing um and really like beethoven died right after he finished his ninth symphony and there were lots of composers after Beethoven that died after writing nine symphonies. Um, Schubert uh, only wrote nine, one of which was unfinished. Um, Gustav Mahler, who hopefully we'll talk about, he wrote nine, was working on a 10th and died. Um, lots, lots of other examples. Um, you know, at some point people kind of got over that superstition, but it was it was a thing for a while you know it's like don't write your ninth symphony because you're gonna you're gonna die you're gonna croak afterwards <laughs> um but anyway his symphonies are the standard um and he has three like distinct periods of like compositions compositional style i, I guess you could say um the first style is uh, the first period is kind of like mozart and haydn um, very heavily influenced by those two. The second period is known as his heroic period. Um, <clears throat> just, you know, lots of, well, he wrote symphony number three, which is called his, what it's called the Eroica or the heroic symphony, uh, which was actually dedicated to Napoleon. Um, it like he, he wrote, he dedicated it in the manuscript and then after Napoleon um, made himself emperor, Beethoven went back and like scratched it out, even basically like ripping through the paper. He was so upset about it. So a little bit of interesting info there. Um, lots of uh, experimentation or just, uh, just kind of finding his own voice during the heroic period. And then the last part was when he was deaf so yeah there's definitely a lot of experimentation here um although the symphony number nine the ode to joy like he wrote that without even being able to to hear it like he heard all of that stuff in his head like that's the crazy thing you know mozart beethoven they heard and they could see all of this music in their head even before they wrote it down like that's just crazy you know me like, yeah, I can hear, like, I hear music in my head all the time, but I can't really write, like, I can, I can kind of piece it together, but it's not like I could hear a whole symphony in my head and just write it down. That, it's insane them being able to actually do that. Um, so, yeah. Um, 
Beethoven, just such an interesting, crazy story. Um, so you guys are going to listen to, I mean, there are a lot of things we could listen to, but we're going to listen to his famous symphony, uh, number five, which is uh, sometimes called uh, fate is, is often tied to this one because um, he wrote this around the time when he uh, was dealing with all of the, the hearing loss stuff. And um, it was written in 1808, and it has this motive or motif, the short, 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 long, bum, 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 like that. That is the fate motive. Everybody knows that's Beethoven. Um, <clears throat> but this symphony, this, it uses this fate motif throughout the whole thing, not just the first movement. It comes up in the second, third, fourth, in, you know, in the finale. Like it, it kind of ties the whole symphony together. And Beethoven was one of the first people to start to do this in their works, to have this motif that keeps coming up uh, throughout and just ties, helps to tie everything. This one idea that kind of ties everything together, which is really cool. And this becomes um, very prominent in the next period, the Romantic period. So um, this movement, you're only going to listen to the first movement. It's a fast movement. It's in sonata form. Um, it has a coda at the end for dramatic closure. Um, just so you know, the second movement is a theme in variations. Third movement, scherzo. And then the fourth movement, it's a fast sonata form. So kind of like what we talked about before. Um, so yeah, you guys will listen to the first movements. Um, this is probably, this, well, this is one of his most famous pieces of music. You know, everybody will recognize this from something. So enjoy that. I wish I could share more with you, but not a lot of time. <laughs> so to summarize, um, being, you know, it's good to remember about the enlightenment, um, this thirst for knowledge, um, political unrest, um, revolutions, all the all that kind of stuff, the middle class, like all of that is boiling and it's sending Europe into a, a time of like big change, lots of big changes coming, coming ahead. Um, piano, the piano takes over from the harpsichord um, during this period. So that's really important to remember. String quartet, symphony um musical style so it's balance symmetry i think the the main word is just structure because form plays such a huge role in this period in in the work of all the composers um so just remember like it's structure like everything is pieced together meticulously like every little part has its place structure that ties in with the forms. Just remember the new forms, um, uh, string quartet, chamber music, you know, symphony, all that stuff. Um, the minuet and trio, um, just, you know, just kind of be familiar with, with those names, minuet and trio, rondo, scherzo, just kind of know what they, know the difference between them. Um, Martinet and the Chevalier, like those are, really two important people that we don't really get to talk about a lot. Mar Martinet being um, a really great female composer, um, the first woman to write a symphony, um, the Chevalier um, being a knight and a composer and a great violin player, almost becoming the, the conductor of the Paris opera, crazy. Yet we don't ever learn about them. So... Um, and then Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, the big three. Um, Haydn, we call him Papa Haydn because he's, I mean, he's old school, you know, he's, he's, um, yeah, he's the father of everything. Mozart, the child prodigy, and Beethoven, the crazy person with the crazy hair um, and deaf. So there you have it the classical period in a nutshell. So um, yeah, next time we'll 
I'll share with you insights into the romantic period. Trust me, I could talk your heads off with the romantic period, but I'm going to try to limit myself. So um, enjoy. Let me know if you have any questions um, about anything and um, everything should be good to go for unit seven. So have a good week.